If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Revelation chapter 3. And we are going to finish up tonight this sermon on uh, the church at Laodicea. The church of Laodicea. And uh, we've entitled this message, Laodicea, Laodicea, neither cold nor hot. And that's exactly what God said about them. And uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. Let's all stand and we're going to read together out of Revelation chapter 3. And uh, we are going to look there from verses 14 through 18. And he says there, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, thank you for your precious word tonight, and your word is precious. Lord, how would we ever live without it? How could we get by one day without your word? Now, Father, help us as we start to study your word tonight and preach your word. Pray, Lord, that we'll open our heart up to you, that we'll never be the same, because we've heard your word. Now, Father, help us as we leave this place to say within our hearts, surely it's been good to be in the house of God. In your precious, sweet name, we pray these things. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, now tell somebody you love them there before you sit down. So as we, as, we, as we have said about these churches, they all have certain things that throughout history that we see in every church, in every church age. And uh, for the church of Ephesus, we saw that it had lost its first love. And uh, it was true about that church. They... they, they did everything that they were supposed to do. They had patience. They refused to tolerate evil men. They had spiritual discernment, but, and they didn't uh, tolerate any kind of false teaching. But the thing that God had against them is that they had lost their first love, uh, that they just wasn't quite as in love with the Lord Jesus as they once was. And how many of you know that in our society today, I think, that a lot of churches are not in love with Jesus like they used to be. And we need to be in love with Jesus, amen? We need to love him supremely. He is our everything. And uh, that is uh, what we need to do as Christians. And then we talked about the church at Smyrna. Now, Smyrna was entitled the Suffering Church, and of course they did. They, they received no rebuke from God at all. God didn't say about them they'd lost their first love. He didn't tell them they were cold and indifferent. He didn't say any rebuke about them at all. This church, even though it was a small church, it had purity, and it was able to suffer through the persecution that came. And how many of you know, even churches, if they stay true to the stuff, and people uh, that are Christians that that stay true to the stuff, you're going to suffer some persecution. People are not going to like you for who you are. They're going to talk about you, and they're going to misuse you. And that was the the subject of this suffering church. Uh, These Christians at Smyrna uh, refused to bow down to Domitian, and that was the one that, that ruled everything, and there was persecution because they refused to bow down to him. 
Matter of fact, they suffered horrible deaths, as we talked about several times in that study. I mean, some of them were put into boiling pots of water. Some of them were hung up in the garden of Domitia, and they, uh, they set them on fire, burn them alive. I mean, that's the way this church was persecuted, the church at Smyrna. And then there was the church at Pergamos. We entitled it the worldly church, and it really was. And being a worldly church, it's like much of our churches today. They have failed to put Jesus Christ number one in the church and made themselves number one and made their programs number one. And worldliness have come into the pew and they haven't done anything about it. They just allowed it to go on. And the church at Pergamum was symbolic of churches that throughout history that has compromised with this old world. And a lot of Christians are compromising with this old world. Pergamos was wicked, though. Matter of fact, it was so wicked, wicked that God called it Satan's seat. Now, that didn't mean that Satan's dwelling place was there, but it meant like they were so wicked that you would think Satan was right there with them. And I've seen some people like that, haven't you? That are so wicked that you would think that Satan just take, had taken over where they were. And uh, the teaching there was the teaching of Balaam. And uh, Balaam taught that everything needed to be sacrificed to idols. They didn't care anything about Jesus, didn't even care anything about God. They put all kinds of idols, and they worshipped idols. And, and God said it was just like being at Satan's seat, being in Satan's house. It was so wicked and without God. They had pagan orgies. They had all these things going on. The Nicolaitans were there. The fourth church we talked about was Thyatira. And this is the church that God said it's a church that tolerated sin. You remember we talked about that woman there, Jezebel. Now, it wasn't the Jezebel in the Bible, but it was, a, it was just a figure of speech talking about a woman that was a Jezebel. She was there teaching false things. Uh, false things in the church and, and they went headlong into the depths of satanic uh, deception and that's what that church was all about they tolerated sin and then the fifth church we talked about was Sardis he called it a dead church he said they, there's no life there he said I can't find any life about them at all now think about that how would you like God to say that about us I find no life about them they have no life. That was Sardis. And then Philadelphia. If you remember, it was the last church we studied, and Philadelphia was that faithful, faithful church. God didn't have anything bad to say about them either. He said they're just faithful. In the midst of tribulation, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of all they went through, God said they were faithful. And then tonight, this church, the church of Laodicea, we talked about the person of this church as we did in all the other uh, churches that we've studied. Who's the person? Who's, who's, this being, uh, who's this being written by? Who's telling us these things? Well, we know that John pinned them down, but we also know that God was given the message. How many of you know tonight you can trust God? When God gives you a message, you can trust Him. So here's the message. He says in verse 14, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. God gives himself some names here. The first thing he says that he wants John to pin down about him is that he is the Amen. We talked about this last week. What is the Amen? Well, the Amen here, when he's saying this, it's a Hebrew word, and it means truth. So in other words, God is saying, first of all, I want you to know I'm the truth. I'm the amen. If you want to know about things, if you want to know how things are going to be, just look at me because I'm going to tell you the truth. That's what Jesus says. He has never let you down. He'll always tell you the truth. The problem with this message and the problem with people that are Christians is they do not read the Bible enough to know the truth. But God wants you to know the truth, and He is the truth. That's what He says. It's a Hebrew word meaning truth. It means firm. It means fixed. It means He's unchangeable. You can never change Him. 
ever. He's always going to be the same. He was the same 60 years ago for my mom and dad when they were in church and, and going through their life. He's the same today. He's the same. He never changes. The next thing he said about identifying himself, he said this. He says, I'm the faithful and true witness. Now, uh, he's completely trustworthy. We know that. But he's perfectly accurate in everything. He's accurate. He's accurate in your life, accurate in what he tells you to do. His testimony is totally reliable. When you read the Word of God and you hear about Jesus Christ, it's reliable. It's totally accurate. The Bible is accurate. How many understand that? There, there's no falseness in it. It's accurate, and that's what he wants you to know about himself. I'm true, I'm accurate. And, and, and then he goes on to say he's completely trustworthy. In John 14, 6, he says it like this. He said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to see God, go through me. Jesus. That's what he says. The third thing he said about himself, he says, I'm the beginning of the creation of God. He wants you to know that he's always been. Everything that is on this earth was made by him, including you. <laughs> it wasn't evolution. He created you. And he wants you to know that, you see. He knew all this stuff would come about in our day and age, you know, all this stuff that's going on about, you know, taking away from the Bible and the Bible can't be all truth and all this. He wants you to know tonight that everything that he says is truth and he's reliable. But not only that, he was from the beginning. He's always been. Listen to what he says here in John 1, 3. Uh, he, you see, he, beginning means through his power everything was created. Listen to John 1, 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. Read that with me. That was made. How many believe that tonight? Say amen. That's what he says about himself. And he wants you to understand that and know that. The second thing we looked at last week was the problem. Now, there's always a problem with this church. And he says this in verses 15 through 17. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. That's what God said. He said, now this is coming to the one, from the one that's all truth, that's accurate in all of his statements, and the one that was from the beginning. Now, I'm telling the church this. It's coming from him. Not John, him. John's pinning it down. But Jesus is saying it. You see, he talks about some things here that he wants them to focus on. The first thing he tells them that they need to focus on in this church is their deeds. You see, deeds always reveal people's true spiritual state. If you're lazy, there's something wrong with your spiritual state. Now, don't look at me like that. There's something wrong with your spiritual state if you don't want to do the things God wants you to do. And they're indicated here uh, with the Lord's words in Matthew 7, 16, when he says this. He says, you'll know my people, and I'm adding to it a little bit, by their works, by what they do, by what they accomplish in their life, by their fruits. That's what he says. And we looked over in Galatians over there. I'm going to read that to you. Here's the fruits. I want to read it to you one more time. How do you know people that are saved? Well, God says you know them by their fruits. So what are the fruits? Uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Read that. And joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. God says, here's the way you know if they're my children. If they have these things. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to have all those things at one time. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. 
But there ought to be a consistency about your Christian life. There ought to be some joy in your Christian life. If you walk around all the time with your chin down to the floor, there's something wrong. Amen. You ought to be kind. People that say, oh, I'm a Christian and treat people awful, there's something wrong. Christians, we can't treat other people awful. Because God says the fruit of the Spirit is, is kindness, is gentleness, that, that we're gentle with people, that, that we have goodness in us, that we have peace in us and long-suffering in us, and, and we have faith. I want you to know tonight that, that, that without faith, I don't know how we'd ever make it. I mean, how would you make it through funerals without faith? How could you ever have joy without the Lord Jesus in your heart? How could you ever? I mean, joy comes for a moment in this old life when you're in sin. It does, don't it? You have some joy in sin, but it, 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 it's fleeting. It, it goes away. But the way I know I'm saved tonight is Jesus gives me joy in the midst of my storms. I might just preach tonight, amen? All right. And then uh, the second thing <laughs> that he said about them, he said that, you know, he was concerned about them, and then he said this, uh, the second thing, not only their deeds, he said, you're neither cold nor hot, but you're lukewarm. And I told you about Laodicea, how he took that from a story, uh, that the water came down the mountain in Laos, uh, Laodicea, it came underground in the aqueducts. By the time it got to the city, seven miles away, the water would run. By the time it got to the city, it was... It was uh, nasty and foul smelling. It wasn't warm that they could take a bath in it. I mean, hot that they could take a bath in it. It, 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 was, it was not cold enough to drink. It wasn't refreshing. It was just lukewarm nasty. And there's a lot of churches that are just lukewarm nasty. I mean, a poor old soul comes in that don't look like them, don't act like them, don't smell like them, comes in and they won't have nothing to do with them. Let me tell you something, that church needs a whipping. And by the way, God will give them one. But that's what God was saying here, you're neither cold or hot, you're lukewarm. And then he says, thirdly about them, he gave them some consequences of being lukewarm. Listen to what he said in verse 16. He said, so then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold or hot, what did he say he's going to do? One preacher put it this way. He says, some churches make the Lord weep, some make him, make him angry. The Laodicean church made him sick. Sick. I can't imagine making the Lord sick, but it did. You know what hot people are spiritually? They're, they're spiritually alive. You can see it. You can feel it when you're around them. They love Jesus, and they talk about Jesus, not just in the bad times, not just when they need it. You know, they, they need to get a little Bible in them, you know, or a little... They, they're that way. They're just, they're just, they're, they just love Jesus. And they won't tell other people about Jesus. And they want people around them that love Jesus. I like being around people that love Jesus, don't you? I love being around church folks. You know, sometimes folks, I think in our day and age, people that go to church just don't like being around each other. Really, I mean, I, I'm being serious. But I want to tell you tonight, I enjoy being around you all. I hope you enjoy being around me. Because I really do. I love you all. I look to you all. And I know you look to me for, for, for messages and, and for leadership spiritually. I know that. And I love that relationship, don't you? But there's a lot of churches, really, folks, that really don't like each other. And that shouldn't be, ever. 
It shouldn't be because what has happened cold and indifferent has come into the church and they've allowed that to stay around. God says, don't let that do that. Don't do that. Because the church should be the spiritual place that we come in and we worship together. And we shouldn't let anything hinder that. Hot people are those that are spiritually alive. They possess a transformed life. The spiritually cold, on the other hand, are best understood as those that have rejected Christ. They just reject everything about them. They come to church on Sunday, they hear the message, and and, and they go home, and they never give in to Christ, never give their life to Christ. They're just spiritually cold, but lukewarm people. Lukewarm, this category, they're not saved at all, yet they really don't openly reject the gospel. They're just lukewarm. And that's dangerous. They attend church every Sunday and God pricks their heart, but they they don't allow God to penetrate their heart. And they leave and that thing just calluses over and calluses over every time they come to church and soon they're so hard. they They can sit in a spiritual atmosphere where God is moving and reject the Holy Spirit. They're lukewarm. They, they're just neither cold nor hot. They just adapted to the environment. And folks, you may not believe this, there's many people that have adapted to the environment. Adapted. Lukewarm. Jesus described these people in Matthew 7, 22 and 23 when he said this, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are those people, you know, that go to church and they don't think anything's wrong. They can sit on the pew and say, well, I don't see anything wrong with abortion, you know. Abortion's all right. It's, a, it's just a way, you know, uh, to get rid of babies that you don't want and all this, you know. And they sit there and say, well, I don't see anything wrong with gay marriage. I don't see anything wrong with a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a woman. I don't see anything wrong. They're just lukewarm. They're in the middle. Won't take a stand for God. God is dissatisfied with those folks. And that's what he said about this place. He was dissatisfied with Laodicea. And then where we're at tonight, the Laodiceans' lukewarmness was compounded by their deception. They were deceived about it. You see, that's what happens. The old devil, once he gets you in this lukewarm state, he, he wants to keep you there. He don't want to let you go. And, they, and they, were, they were all right with it. They were deceived. But Christ... In this scripture, rebuke them for their inaccurate self-assessment. When they said in verse 17, here's what they thought when they looked at themselves in the mirror. Here's what they thought they really were. Because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Does that not sound like our society tonight? Oh, I don't need him. I don't need God. And that's what a lot of people says tonight. That's the reason the churches on Sunday are not full anymore. People don't need God. They don't need Him. Because they think within themselves, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have everything I need, I have need of nothing. I, and notice that, and God said, know you not that you are wretched, and you're miserable, and poor, and you're blind, and you're naked. That's what he said. He said, listen to me. You're not any of those things. You're not there. You're lukewarm. You're cold. They were rich in spiritual pride, but they were bankrupt in saving grace. Oh, they were prideful. and thought they didn't need God, didn't need anything, but they were lost. 
They believed that they were envied by everybody, but you know what? They were pitied by God. He looked at them and said, You're pitiful. You're pitiful. Jesus pointed at them and said, You're dead spiritually. You're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind and you're naked. That's what he said about them. The third thing is the counsel that God gave him. Look at verses 18 through 20. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, and thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You see, right away, Jesus instantly could have judged them and just took them all out. I think sometimes we forget that. How powerful God is. And how mighty God is. I think sometimes we... We just sit and play Russian roulette in our spiritual lives. You see, he could have destroyed this church. Instead, graciously, he offered them salvation. He offered them a way out of their horrible lifestyle and their wickedness and and their pride. He offered them a way out. And God is still doing that tonight. That's a reason on Sunday mornings we give an altar call. That's a reason on Sunday night we give an altar call. That's a reason on Wednesday night we give an altar call. You want to know why? Where you may have a chance to make things right. Christ's threefold appeal uh, has three features here, and I want you to see them. First of all, when he's talking to the uh, the city of Laodicea, he, he was bringing the things that they were most noted for in this scripture. He said they're most noted for their wealth, their wool industry, and their eye salve. That's what they were noted for. Now, the Lord did not teach that salvation may be earned by good works here. I don't want you to think that. He wasn't teaching that. You see... The word buy here, when he says, I counsel thee to buy. Now listen real good here. Is the same as that of the invitation uh, to salvation found in Isaiah chapter 51 or 55 verse 1. When he said this about the same thing. He said, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat ye. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. So what was he talking about buying here? Well, when I started studying this, all sinners, all you and I have to offer to the Lord Jesus Christ is our wretchedness. That's all we have. When I got saved, all I had to offer God was my sins. How about you? You remember the story of uh, Homer. You, you remember these uh, stories, and, and, or Gomer, I mean, I said Homer, Gomer. You remember the story where she, they, they were up on the, the shopping block, on the, the trade block, on the uh, you know, servant block, and they sold them? That's kind of the way we were when we were lost. We were in sin, and we were lost, and we needed to be bought back. Guess who bought us? Jesus bought us. He bought us with what? His precious blood. And we need to always remember that and never forget that. That we didn't buy our salvation. He bought us. He bought us with His precious blood. You see, all we have to offer is our wretchedness, our lost condition. And in exchange for that, Christ offers us righteousness. 
Christ had advised the Laodiceans to buy from him three things. Listen to what he asked them to buy. Now, everybody with me, say amen. I'm going to quit after this because you're about to go to sleep on me. Say amen. The first thing that he told them to buy was gold refined by fire. Look at verse 18. Gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. You see, they needed gold. They needed riches that was free from impurities. And this gold represents the purity and the richness of salvation. How many of you know that that salvation is pure? Salvation is rich. It it costs more than we could ever come out to, to pay for it. And that's what God was showing to these Laodiceans. He was telling them that it's pure. It's a true salvation. It will bring you a relationship with a true living God. If you will allow it to. So he said, you need to buy gold. Try it in the fire. The second thing he told them, he advised them to buy white raiment. Now, he, he's saying these things because... They are used to these things. This is what they do. They make clothes, wool. He says there in verse 18, White raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do do not appear. You see, as I said, Laodiceans uh, were famous for their wool, which symbolized here, God was symbolizing it as being filthy and sinful, the simple garments of sin and unregenerate clothes, that they were lost. That's what he was saying. But then he's, in contrast, he says, I'll redeem you with white garments. I'll take your sin, clean you up, and give you purity, and give you a white garment, make you pure. I know you don't feel pure tonight, but listen to me. Jesus saved you. Don't ever belittle salvation. What Jesus did in your heart, how he cleansed you and made you whole. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad tonight that you've been cleansed and made whole? Through Jesus Christ. He said, I'll take your old garments and I'll give you white garments, the whiteness of purity and and righteousness and genuine faith. That's what I'll do for you if you allow me to. He was telling the Laodiceans. The third thing he offered them was eye salve. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Verse 18 says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You see, the Laodiceans uh, prided themselves on their, um, their... superiority in spiritual knowledge. They thought they saw. They thought they really knew. But they didn't. They were blind. This old world thinks they really know. Oh, preacher, don't you know there's many ways to God? Don't you know uh, Muhammad's on this side and this one's on this side and there's many ways? God says, no, there's only one way. And that's the way they were. They were blinded spiritually. God says, let me open your eyes up. Aren't you glad tonight that Jesus Christ opened your eyes up? (laughs) Christ loves the unredeemed. He loves people that are lost. and He rebukes them and he wants to reprove them here. He wants to expose their sin here and that's what he's doing. And this blindness represents a lack of understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Unregenerate people. The Laodiceans desperately needed Christ to open their eyes that they could get out of the darkness. And one way God said they could get out of the darkness is verse 19 when he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. We need to understand tonight when God convicts us and chastens us, it's because He loves us. It's because He's trying to bring us to Him. We're going away, we're getting farther and farther away, and He's trying to bring us closer. So He chastens us. He whips us. Thank God for His whippings. Because we need them. 
I'm thankful that he's a father that loves me enough to, to whip me, to bring me back and convict me. He wanted these Laodiceans to be saved. He said, here's the way you be saved. Here's the way you come and get all these things I've offered you, all, all of these different things that I want you to buy. Here's the way you get it. He said in verse 19, be zealous and repent. Repent. Folks, you cannot get to God unless you repent. Repent of your sins. Just because daddy brought you to church and mama brought you to church and daddy was a preacher and mama taught a Sunday school class, that doesn't get you to God. Repent. Turn away from your wickedness. Mourn over the sin that's in your life. Hunger and thirst after righteousness sake. That's what God says. God's message to this lost church is to pursue repentance that leads to life. The second thing he told him is in verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus was outside of this apostate church, and he wanted in. Well, that's a sad picture, isn't it? That's where he was. He was outside of it. They wouldn't even let him in. That word sup there means I want to come in and dine with you. I want to come in and have fellowship with you. That's what Jesus did with you when you got saved. You had to open up. You had to give him your heart. And when you did, he came in to dine with you, to sup with you, to eat with, to have fellowship with you. And by the way, he's still having fellowship with you if you're saved. You gave him your heart. And that's what God is saying here. That's what he's telling these people at Laodicea. I want to dine. I want to have fellowship and communion. But they shut him out. There's a lot of people shutting out God in their lives tonight. A lot of people don't want to have fellowship with the Lord. But last but not least, the promise that God gives them in Revelation 3, 21, 22. To him that overcometh, overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To enjoy fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and His kingdom and throughout all of eternity is a blessing beyond comprehension. When you got more people over there than you got here, you know what I'm saying right there. One of these days we're all going to be together. No more death, no more pain, no more suffering. Can you just comprehend that tonight? That's the promise that God has given us, a, a blessing beyond all comprehension. I wrote down just a few things about overcomers. That's us. Our privileges and promises that God has given us through the Bible, through Revelation. One of them was that one of these days we'll eat from the tree of life. One of the promises, we'll receive a crown of life. We'll have protection from the second death. We don't have to go to hell. How many can say amen right there? God promised that. A white stone with a new name written on it. I don't know what your name's going to be, only he does. White garments symbolizing purity, holiness, the honor of having Christ confess our names before God the Father and the angels in heaven. This is my child. Boy, isn't that going to be something? I believe some of you are going to be shouting. And I'm going to be there laughing at you because I'm going to say, I told you you'd shout. To be made a pillar in God's temple and to have written on them the name of God. We're going to have the name of God on us one day. We're going to be His forevermore. Boy, isn't that something? 
<laughs> this letter to the Laodiceans closed with Christ's exhortation when he said this, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's the seventh church. All of them we've been through. You know about the seven churches now, right? You know they represent history. That some of our churches will have some of these things. But we know, as I said last week, this Laodicean church, it seems to me that we have a lot of those things going on in the church age that we're in. Let's bow our head and thank the Lord. Lord, we love you tonight. And we thank you for your precious word. Your word is so precious. Lord, I am so thankful that you allow me to preach your word. I'm so thankful tonight that you called me to be a preacher of the gospel. And I ask tonight that as we leave this place that we'll be so, so knowing that salvation is such a great thing. We have so much to look forward to. And we thank you tonight for salvation. We thank you for your gift of life. Now you may be here tonight and God is speaking to you. Maybe you know somebody you need to come and pray for tonight. There is nothing wrong. Listen to me, folks. There is nothing wrong with coming to an old-fashioned altar and praying. And tonight, maybe you just need to come and pray. Well, wait just a moment. Would you step out from where you are if you need to come tonight?